Hello and welcome to the Outsider Art Podcast, Episode 9, Bill Trailer. Now, I will admit to being somewhat nervous about presenting a podcast on Bill Trailer. I'm not well versed in American history, and my knowledge of the antebellum South, emancipation, and Jim Crow segregation is minimal to say the least. And Bill Trailer's life intersected with all three of these significant periods in US history. That his artistic output springs so inextricably from these experiences, as well as from an historically complex black culture that was in the throes of undergoing a massive sea change, means that Trailer's work is both mysterious, complicated, and to a large degree unknowable. However, thanks to some seriously dedicated research and work by art historians, curators, and scholars over the past few decades, there are many more tools available to help us to a greater understanding of Trailer's seemingly simple drawings and paintings. Since I started the Judith Scott episode with a quote from Roberta Smith, I thought it only fair to begin this episode with some thoughts from Jerry Sulse, from his 2019 review of the David Schwermer show, Bill Trailer. Quote, In Trailer, we can see the power of the individual voice, of working with the tools and materials at hand to envision a whole world in one style. His imprint is as distinctive as any artist who ever lived. His story is a vision of hell, but the work is transcendent and essential. End quote. I think this quote captures what is so compelling about Trailer's art and why so many have been drawn to it. Understanding the deeply unsettling history of the American South has been a necessary preoccupation since before the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, and the arts have proven to be fertile ground in opening up the doors of perception to a time when the USA was going through its most fundamental social change. Trailer's work, while being, as Salt says, an individual voice, also reflects back at us the experience of being black in America in the second half of the 19th and first half of the 20th century. Sometimes this reflection is clear, but more often than not, it is hidden behind visual metaphor and esoteric symbolism, especially for viewers unfamiliar with black history and culture. Leslie Umberger, curator for folk and self-taught art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, comments on this in an article in Antiques Journal from 2018. The article was extracted from the monograph Between Worlds, The Art of Bill Trailer, which accompanied the 2018-2019 major retrospective of Trailer's work at the Smithsonian. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get my hands on a copy of this book as I researched this episode, which is regrettable as by all accounts it is a significant and highly detailed exploration into both Trailer's life and his art. I'll put details on the episode reading list on the podcast website. I'll also include a YouTube link to the Smithsonian Symposium which accompanied the exhibition, which, while it is four hours long, is well worth watching. Anyway, back to the quote from Umberger. Quote, Trailer's imagery often holds veiled meanings and lessons underneath the veneer of simplicity or humour. Trailer experimented with abstraction and became adept at using it. He would have understood acutely that faithful representation could be perilous for a black man to pursue. His art reveals the various ways in which he skirted clarity and mitigated risk. End quote. When Trailer began constructing the pictorial representation of his life in the late 1930s, he was essentially homeless, living on the streets of Montgomery, Alabama, and sleeping in a makeshift back room at the local funeral parlour. He was 85 at the time, and his studio was the street, Monroe Avenue in particular, in the black business district, and he worked in full public view in interaction with his community. There are a number of photographs of Trailer working, seated on his stool, beside a Coca-Cola cooler, with either a board on his lap or a small table in front of him. 
He would sell his work to passers-by, and while the local population around Monroe Avenue would have been predominantly black, Alabama at the time was segregated under the Jim Crow laws. The Ku Klux Klan was still entrenched in the South, and dissent or critical commentary would have been risky and potentially life-threatening. That trailer was able to skirt risk while still telling his story and speaking his truth and the truth of black America is primarily due to the fact that he used a visual language that said something completely different to a black audience than to a white. This is a visual language that has held its power over the decades, through the civil rights movement and right up to Black Lives Matter of our current time. Some of his images darkly dance with imagery that evokes a level of threat and imminent danger. The chase and fleeing feature in his work. Whether the chase to humans or animals matters little, the sense of tension and terror is palpable. Vicious dogs bear their fangs, fingers point menacingly, snakes crawl through scenes, weapons and acts of violence are frequently seen. Other images of figures arranged around bold constructions form mysterious tableaus with the actors frozen in time but potent with life and meaning. In the aforementioned Smithsonian Symposium, Randall Morris speaks of the African-American religious practice of conjure or hoodoo and its relation to Trailer's work. In a piece in Raw Vision magazine, Morris writes, quote, the practice of this religion was an enslaved people's spiritual survival strategy, using cultural resistance to create and find a common ground under the most oppressed circumstances. It was not dogmatic, it was fluid, and it was the world view that black southerners grew up with, more orthodox early on and more grassroots in the presence. This was the world in which Trailer grew up. He goes on to say, Looking at Trailer's body of work in its entirety, there is an obvious and sizable group of drawings for which there are no ready explanations. Other drawings are portraits of people in ambiguous situations that suggest the presence of powerful forces. There is a constant presence of hoodoo icons with his use of plants and snakes, red eyes, finger pointing and iron objects. We see humans merged with plants. We see the codified colours that still possess their original meanings of importance. Danger, anger, amuletic protection and so on. End quote. So, let's take a look at the life experiences of Bill Trailer in order to be able to place him in an historical context. Born into slavery in 1853, there seems to be no official record of his birth date, Often it is reckoned as 1854, but Leslie Umberger, having trawled through a mountain of records as part of her research for the Beyond Worlds show, has approximated it as the earlier date, so we'll stick with that. She also mentions that Trailer would say that his birth date was April 1st. He was born on the plantation of John Trailer, and as such was given the family name of his owners, which is a disturbing phrase to have to say. John Trailer's plantation was in Dallas County, Alabama, and during the American Civil War in 1863, when Bill was about 10, his family were relocated to the plantation of John's brother George in Lowndes County. When emancipation came in 1865, Bill Trailer's family remained on George's land as labourers. He was to spend the majority of his life as a labourer or tenant farmer working the land around Montgomery acquiring the vast array of skills necessary to do so, but never being able to progress financially. Emancipation may have brought a freedom from slavery, but it did not necessarily bring financial or social liberation, or offer social mobility for the uneducated and illiterate such as Trailer. Umberger comments on this, quote, Trailer spent almost all of his working years amid a culture that overtly preferred blacks to be illiterate and submissive, automatically accept accounting records that never seem to come out in their favour, and toil endlessly on land that belonged to someone else, all while living in extreme poverty, without adequate nutrition or health care, and with the unremitting fear of wondering what comes next. End quote. 
Trailer had three marriages and approximately 14 children. And when his third wife Laura died in the mid-1920s and his children had all left, many for the north, Trailer moved to Montgomery in 1927 or 1928. Again, there are conflicting dates regarding Trailer's move to Montgomery, but he would have been in Montgomery at the time the Great Depression began to bite, and being already an old man and unable to undertake work in the late 1930s due to rheumatism, he would have been a recipient of state aid brought in under Roosevelt's New Deal. There is even a trailer drawing of two workers beneath the letters NRA and WPA, which are abbreviations of two of these relief programs. By 1939, Trailer was jobless and homeless and had set himself up on Munro Avenue and began drawing in pencil on pieces of found cardboard. He would hang his drawings up behind him and passers-by would stop to watch him work and sometimes buy his drawings. A photograph of Trailer in the Alabama Journal from 1948, which accompanied an article by Alan Rankin, was titled quote, He'll paint for you. Big uns, 20 cents. Little ones, a nickel. End quote. In the early years of 1939, the young artist Charles Shannon encountered Trailer at work. Shannon, who founded the short lived but important cultural centre New South that same year, and who had long been fascinated with African American culture, describes first meeting Trailer. Quote, one Saturday morning in the early summer of 1939, an old black man was sitting on a box by the fence in front of the blacksmith's shop. He had a white beard and was hunched over, like he might be drawing. Walking closer, I could see that he held a stub of a pencil and was ruling clean straight lines on a piece of cardboard, using a short stick for a straight edge. He was deeply engrossed in what he was doing, and I later discovered he was experiencing making marks on paper for the first time. The next day I found him there again. The ruled lines had given way to objects, rats, cats, cups, tea kettle, and other silhouetted shapes neatly distributed across the rectangle. In the days that followed, he drew a version of the blacksmith's shop. End quote. He supplied Trailer with drawing materials, including coloured pencils and poster paint. He also gave Trailer drawing board, but Trailer preferred to keep using the found cardboard. Shannon would go on to collect and champion Trailer's work, including organising a show at New South in 1940 entitled Phil Trailer, People's Artist. It's thanks to Shannon that there are over 1,000 extant Trailer works from the period that he collected between 1939 until 1942, when he was drafted into military service until 1946. Any works completed after this time were not kept by Shannon, although Trailer apparently told him that he had not made any drawings during the war years. Trailer had lived with his daughter in Washington, D.C. and other relatives in Detroit, Chicago, New York and Philadelphia during this period, but had returned to Montgomery. In D.C., he had had his gangrenous left leg amputated. From 1946 until his death, Trailer lived with his daughter Sarah in Montgomery. Some confusion surrounded the year of Trailer's death, with Shannon believing that he passed in 1947, but it is now believed that he died in St. Jude's Hospital in Montgomery on October 23, 1949. He would have been 95 or 96 years old. During his lifetime, Trailer's work was exhibited twice, once in the New South show, which generated some local press, including an article in the Montgomery Advertiser entitled, quote, The Enigma of Bill Trailer, born a slave, untutored in art, his paintings are reminiscent of cave paintings, and Picasso, end quote. In 1942, an exhibition was organised by Victor E. D'Amico, at the Fieldston School in Riverdale, New York, entitled Bill Trailer, American Primitive, Works of an Old Negro. Shannon had met D'Amico through a mutual friend in 1941 and had introduced him to Trailer's work. D'Amico had showed Trailer's drawings to Alfred Barr, the then director of the Museum of Modern Art, 
who wished to add some of them to the museum's collection. However, the purchase fell through due to Shannon rejecting the sale after being sent a check for the works, but not having been consulted regards the price. So, unfortunately, Trailer's work did not make it into the influential MoMA collection during his lifetime, and it was not until many decades after his death that he was finally recognised in the Breakthrough 1982 exhibition Black Folk Art in America, 1930-1980, at the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Let's go back to that Jerry Saltz review for his take on seeing Trailer's work at this time. Quote, I first saw Trailer's work in my 30s, the first time it was nationally exhibited in 1982, and it blew my mind. Every person, animal and structure, has this perfect relationship to and conversation with the four sides of the paper. Someone's feet might be just on the bottom of the page. The hat of a standing man just touches the top of the paper. His raised finger pings the top edge. This isn't some quaint, folksy art. Trailer is up there with Picasso in this formal regard. End quote. I can't help but see the parallels between Charles Shannon and Tamo Pasto in terms of the discovery narrative. Both came upon the respective artists that will profoundly influence their lives by accident. Both collective, archived and later profited financially and professionally from the work of these artists. Both had a major influence until recently on the myth-making that surrounds both artists. But, without them first recognising, often in opposition to popular opinion of the time, and then dedicating themselves to preserving the work of Trailer and Ramirez, we very likely would have lost the work of both artists to the winds of history. I'd like to close this episode on Bill Trailer with a quote from Joseph Helfenstein's essay in the book entitled Bill Trailer, William Edmondson and the Modernist Impulse. Quote, Knowing little, if anything, about the mainstream art world, neither Trailer nor Edmondson consciously responded to the traditions of art. However, there can be no doubt that the experience of the aesthetic existed in the everyday life of their respective culture, in the churches, bars, homes and streets. Obviously, their view of art was different from the dominant concept of established European and American culture. Like any contemporary artist, Trailer and Edmondson drew identity from different sources, from dominant American popular culture, by which they were surrounded, from their African-American community and its cultural traditions, and, on a deeper, unconscious level, on the African legacy, whose remnants still survived. Both Trailers and Edmondson's art is located in the modern tradition of hybrid, non-Western culture, and in the precarious territory of subculture, the ghetto at the margins of American consumer society. End quote. I hope that this episode on Bill Trailer has whet your appetite for further investigation of his work. When I first decided to do an episode on Trailer, I did so from a gut instinct compelled by the raw simplicity and power of his art. Having dug a little deeper, and with a better, though by no means complete understanding, I see that Trailer's work offers viewers so much more than I expected. It is, I believe, a portal into the soul of America and with the right lens can play an instructive role in healing the hurt of a nation. As always, I have drawn on a fine body of scholarship in putting this episode together, and will be posting a reading list on the podcast website at shows.acast.com slash outsider-art-podcast. I would thoroughly recommend taking a look at some or all of the references. There are some very considered essays, incredible photos of both Trailer and Montgomery during this time, and of course, beautiful reproductions of his work. Also, just a bit of housekeeping. You may have noticed that both Judith Scott and Bill Trailer have been covered in single episodes, while I took three episodes each for Adolf Wolfley and Martin Ramirez. This is not because of some arbitrary ranking system that values some artists as three-episode artists and others as one-episode artists but because I am still sorting my shit out in terms of putting each episode together. 
I especially struggled for the Wolfley and Ramirez series of episodes, which is why there were three each. My intention with the podcast is to encourage you guys to want to spend more time looking into each artist after each episode. It's more about a taste than a full meal, so I am aiming to try to stick to a single episode for each artist from now on. If I don't manage, and I do see myself struggling to do just one episode on Henry Daga, it's not because any one artist is more important than any other, but just because I'm ill-disciplined. I haven't yet decided who's coming up next on the podcast, so that will be a surprise for the new year. And on that note, all the best of the season to you and yours, and wishing you a Merry Christmas and a fruitful 2021. I sincerely hope that it will be better than this train wreck of a year. As always, if you can please review, subscribe, follow and share the Outsider Art Podcast. It would be much appreciated. And if you have any feedback, feel free to join up to our severely undersubscribed Facebook page and comment to your heart's content. There's a link to the Facebook page on the podcast website. Thanks so much for listening and I look forward to you joining me next time on the Outsider Art Podcast.